good afternoon from Paris. Uh, so uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, to greet all of you from uh, on behalf of the World Heritage Center and the UNESCO headquarters. Welcome to uh, to this training. Um, and I'd like to express uh, our gratitude to uh, to our office colleagues uh, in, in in Bangkok uh, who took uh, these uh, important initiatives to uh, to organize this training not uh, only for, uh, for for the countries under coverage but also for for the whole Mekong cluster countries. So thank you very much, and also for uh, for for, um, for many of you from uh, the, the participating countries. Some of you uh, know perhaps uh, 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 perfectly uh, the, the mechanism of the World Heritage Convention, but I think uh, it's still uh, useful to recall some of the most important uh, uh, points of the convention as a basis uh, of uh, uh, the basis of the, um, the understanding. Uh, the importance of impact assessment for World Heritage Management. So I share my screen. Um, uh, do you see my screen? Is it okay? Yes, we do. Yeah. Okay. Yes, it is okay. <laughs> so, this presentation records some fundamental points concerning the implementation of the convention as shown on the slide. After this part, if time allows, uh, of course, and the, at the end of the session, as Ms. Montero said, there is uh, uh, the question and answer uh, session. But uh, if you want to, uh, to write down the questions already in the chat box, it will help me to, uh, to, to answer, perhaps at the end of this, uh, this session. So as you know it, um, the World Heritage Convention was born in 1972 as a result of the growing international consciousness that the responsibility to preserve some of the most outstanding natural places, cities, built elements of the world belongs not only to individual nations, but to the international community as a whole. As of today, you know that 1,154 properties are inscribed on the World Heritage List. And the convention has a total of 194 state parties, including 27 countries which do not have yet the inscribed properties. So you belong to this global community of this convention, which is one of the most universal legal instruments in, in this world. So let me introduce, uh, let me start with the operational guidelines. In addition to the convention's text itself, presenting the provisions of the World Heritage concept and its most important rules, the operational guidelines provide more detailed and technical guidance to its implementation. So I, I firmly recommend that uh, uh, all of you have uh, both uh, uh, either, you know, this uh, paper versions or online versions of this uh, operational guidelines. Uh, and because it includes, for instance, the formulation of the tentative list, the preparation of nomination files, and the important three for our workshop, on the various aspects of the management, conservation, monitoring of the World Heritage properties. So the most recent version of the operational guidelines is the one revised in 2019. But just for, for your information, we are currently uh, adding other revision to this uh, uh, most recent version to include uh, uh, a very important change, uh, change in the process of the nomination. Uh, so if you are interested, uh, I can show, I can also send the information on this, um, uh, on this uh, preliminary assessment process, which is added to, uh, to the nomination process. So my presentation will extract some of the most important points to consider when an impact assessment is designed. So you know that uh, uh, every uh, World Heritage uh, property, sorry, uh, has this uh, outstanding universal value for which they were inscribed on the World Heritage list. So a statement of the outstanding universal value. 
is of great benefit to all involved in the conservation of the property, as this description and definition allows a clear understanding of why the property is considered to be of uh, outstanding universal value and can give direction to management through indicating what attributes of the property need to be maintained and can guide the assessment of the state of conservation of the property, of course. And uh, this is in a, an essential reference point for monitoring for the World Heritage Committee and the advisory bodies. So I think uh, um, for planning any uh, impact assessment studies, it's first of all very important to, uh, to, to look back to this outstanding universal value statement and to do some, um, uh, some work uh, to, uh, to see clearly what are the values which are included and to be uh, protected uh, for your property. So this graphic shows you, in short, the outstanding universal value is evidenced and maintained when three important pillars stand firmly. So these are three uh, points. The criteria and integrity and authenticity of a given World Heritage property and protection and management uh, arrangement. So all these uh, points are uh, explained in more detail uh, in the operational guidelines with, uh, uh, with, with specific parts. So any sign of one of these pillars collapsing or compromised actually would lead to a judgment that our heritage property's outstanding universal value is threatened. As part of outstanding universal value, Authenticity is a concept which is applied only to cultural heritage. So this is one of the, uh, the pillars um, of, uh, of the outstanding universal value. It is used to, to for evaluating the truthfulness of cultural values through many aspects of a property, such as form and design, materials, use and function. Therefore, for the management and the monitoring of World Heritage property, it is important to note what are elements of authenticity which is applied to a concerned site and take necessary measures in order to preserve these elements. So you see on the slide uh, uh, the elements uh, of this authenticity, which could be extracted uh, from uh, your outstanding universal value and to be uh, also studied in your impact assessment. So another important notion of outstanding universal value is uh, a measure of the wholeness and intactness of the natural or natural, uh, sorry, and or natural heritage and cultural heritage and its attributes which carry outstanding universal value. So this is called integrity. So assessing the extent of which the property has its integrity can be evaluated through the existence of, uh, for instance, a all elements necessary to express its outstanding universal value, B, adequate size to ensure the complete representation of the features and processes which convey the property's significance and any adverse effects of development and or neglect uh, on the site and uh, uh, around. So evidently, in order to sustain and enhance the outstanding universal value, it is necessary to ensure robust, sound, and healthy management system in terms of registration, expertise, and planning capacities. So the matrix shows that uh, the management and the conservation of the world heritage properties are actually not an individual uh, actions, uh, but uh, some uh, concerted, uh, balanced, uh, management uh, uh, structure is really necessary, um, including to, uh, to, to conceptualize and uh, plan uh, this um, impact assessment. So all these elements are mutually supporting to ensure the sustainability of world heritage properties. 
So just to quickly, uh, on the World Heritage website, you have uh, plenty of resource manuals uh, for elaborating and updating management plans and uh, other necessary studies. So please check uh, from time to time our website to, uh, to be updated. So now we go to uh, how World Heritage Properties are monitors uh, its nature and cycle. So monitoring of a World Heritage Site is a base of all management activity, as you know better than me. And the site managers are engaged in this exercise in their everyday work. But beyond this routine monitoring, there are also particularly intense monitoring processes when a property on the World Heritage List is considered to be uh, threatened. So this is called reactive monitoring. Currently, more than 100 World Heritage properties are in this reactive monitoring process. And the state of conservation is closely studied by the World Heritage Committee. So during the July <clears throat> most recent session of the World Heritage Committee, some of uh, uh, your World Heritage sites uh, were actually studied by the committee. This is me meant uh, that uh, your site is uh, under this reactive monitoring process where uh, the committee considers um, that uh, more attention is needed to, uh, to ensure the quality of the conservation of the property. So the operational guidelines explains different processes of this reactive monitoring. And this is so bureaucratic things, but uh, it's very important to, to know how uh, different uh, um, uh, processes are, are triggered and uh, how they are based uh, in the convention. So first of all, what triggers reactive monitoring? Uh, otherwise, uh, um, in other words, uh, how um, uh, a site is in the, uh, in the reactive monitoring process and not the others, why? So um, mainly uh, the committee decisions uh, decide naturally uh, which sites uh, should be monitored under this uh, intense process. And also uh, the process by state party, uh, the information provided by the state party on development projects, uh, sometimes trigger also uh, this reacting monitoring process. And also the third party information, uh, we go uh, more in detail in, in the successive slides and the uh, unforeseeable uh, disasters, conflict, and natural uh, hazard, et cetera, et cetera. So these paragraphs 172 and 174, so what they are all about. So the paragraph 172 uh, is, uh, as I said, uh, this is a process uh, to be uh, introduced by state parties. So the proactive role of national authorities are very important. So how this is uh, um, uh, proceed? So the state parties, uh, so this paragraph 172 invites the state parties to inform the committee, meaning the, the World Heritage Secretariat, uh, of their intention to undertake or to authorize in an area protected under the convention, major restorations or new constructions, which may affect the outstanding universal value of the property before making any decisions that would be difficult to reverse so that the committee may assist in seeking appropriate solutions to ensure that the outstanding universal value of the property is fully preserved. So it shows the importance of proactive approaches uh, from state parties because they um, are invited to, uh, to, uh, to inform uh, the committee of their intention of undertaking the major development uh, which can have impact of the uh, the uh, the outstanding universal value 
So when it can be done? Uh, so the state parties should uh, notify uh, the secretariat as soon as possible, for instance, before drafting basic documents for the development project. So even before, you know, the, the concrete design of the projects, uh, because uh, it's really important to initiate this process before making any important decisions that would be difficult to reverse because you can imagine that uh, once uh, these very important projects are initiated there is a fund there is human resources mobilized sometimes bilateral agreement and it will be uh, really um, a great waste of time and resources if uh, you should uh, reorient these projects uh, after uh, this uh, initiating process uh, because of the committee's uh, views uh, against or um, emitting some uh, suggestions for, for the correction of the course of the development of this project. So why we, it is important uh, um, for the state parties to uh, initiate this process is that uh, because the committee is not, uh, it doesn't exist to, uh, to object all the development project uh, naturally, because uh, what is most important is to, to introduce a balanced approach between the preservation prerogatives and uh, legitimate needs for development. So the committee's wish is to assist the state parties in seeking appropriate solutions uh, to ensure that the OUV, uh, including this integrity, authenticity of the property is fully preserved while uh, necessary developmental measures or any initiatives which are necessary for human well-being and social uh, and economic development could be coexisted with the values of the, the heritage. So basically, this uh, uh, paragraph 172 states uh, that uh, this notification from the state parties should contain results of uh, uh, impact assessment, as you see on the screen, with specific section on potential impact of project on the outstanding universal value. Uh, because uh, sometimes we receive this impact assessment, uh, but uh, really a general one, uh, explaining the, the environmental social assessment impacts, but without uh, analyzing anything specific on the impacts, uh, the potential impacts of such project on the outstanding universal value. So this is uh, important to note that uh, when we design these different impact assessment, depending on the situation, uh, which will be explained better uh, by our yeah, experts in the following sessions, um, to think about how to integrate the analysis uh, of threats and risks uh, of this project on the outstanding universal value. So here uh, we, we have some very important information. Sometimes uh, when we request the impact assessments to the state parties on the developmental project, they reply to me in saying, yeah, but uh, Miss Now, we thought this project is outside of all the heritage property and buffer zone. So we didn't know that uh, we should uh, take care of it. Um, yeah. That's um, something which is uh, sometimes conceived as a very um, ambiguous point, but potential threats and risks of a development project do not only depend on its geographical location, but the probability that such a given project could place on the elements of the outstanding universal value, some threats, um, <clears throat> is uh, uh, it, this is something which is not uh, only depending on the location of the project. So the paragraph 118 bis of the operational guidelines uh, states very clearly about HAIs, the EIAs and the SEAs that uh, these studies are prerequisite for development projects and activities planned within or around our heritage property. 
of course, this is doesn't apply to all, you know, projects uh, outside uh, the zones. But uh, the but the the, um, the principles is that uh, it's a judgment if such project has uh, even slight uh, potential impacts on the values of the world heritage property. So this is something to, to note uh, from uh, this 118 bis of the operational guidelines. So um, also these impact assessment, even outside uh, the, the project, outside the world heritage boundaries and the buffer zones serve to identify development alternatives, positive and negative impacts uh, on the OUV of the property and to recommend mitigation measures, strengthening resilience of heritage to disasters and the climate change. So I uh, invite you to read uh, uh, the paragraphs concerning uh, this impact assessment on, um, in the uh, operational guidelines. So now we go to other paragraph 174. <laughs> So 174 uh, refers to the process by third party. You know, uh, I think uh, some of you have experienced to receive a letter from World Heritage Center in saying that we received such a letter or media article uh, concerning your property, uh, raising some issues uh, and concerns on the state of conservation. So this is typically the process of the 174 that secretariat is informed by third parties saying uh, such things like the new developmental project or the state of conservation uh, 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 is really deteriorated. Uh, so, so it happens uh, anytime and the secretariat sent this information to state party concerns and uh, request uh, their comments to verify what is happening really on site. So this is uh, absolutely the process uh, of, um, uh, of confidentiality, I say. Uh, we do not disclose you know, the contents of our exchange with the state parties, but uh, we, uh, we always uh, share the information to request uh, uh, the comments of the state parties. So after the uh, um, information received um, from uh, um, the state parties, uh, there is a technical reviews by ad uh, advisory bodies. So the information uh, is uh, shared with advisory bodies. Um, and then uh, advisory bodies are expected to uh, provide um, uh, the, the review on uh, the situation uh, or the information, the response provided by the state party uh, within uh, a two months period, except for specific complex cases. So after these uh, two uh, paragraphs, um, so what are the possible scenario? So sometimes, uh, fortunately, we say there is no threat on OUV, the technically uh, insured. And then uh, there are different degrees of threats, uh, which are considered like potential threat. So we, we continue exchange with the state party to further information. And potential serious threat, and we, in this case, we suggest a report to World Heritage Committee, the State of Conservation report. And then uh, the most uh, serious case is a certain threat. So we are uh, sure that there is uh, the threat on the world, uh, the, the outstanding survival. So in this case also, we report to the World Heritage Committee. And also uh, there is uh, uh, examples of uh, suggesting the dangerous thing. So very quickly, uh, the cycle of this reporting. So the paragraph 169, reactive monitoring cycle. So usually um, uh, there are two different cycles of reactive monitoring. There is a property which is studied every year and the others uh, every two years. So for the one um, which is in the two year cycle, uh, the report from the state party is requested on the 1st of December. 
And then um, other most uh, uh, pressing case, like uh, the properties on danger listing or at most urgency, we request uh, the report on the 1st of February of the year uh, where the, uh, the World Heritage Committee uh, will be held to, to study uh, the case. So this state of conservation reports uh, are first of all prepared by state parties. So some of you know very well because uh, you, you submit these reports to me. Um, so this contains uh, um, the element uh, according to uh, the structure, which is suggested in Annex 13 of the operational guidelines. So the committee decision document, the draft document, uh, is established on the basis of your reports, the state party reports, and sometimes mission reports, uh, reactive monitoring mission and previous decisions, uh, which contain the, so the analytical part and then the, the draft decision. So now um, the role of the World Heritage Committee. So I think some of you already attended the physical session or perhaps this year online session, uh, the, uh, the World Heritage Committee's debate. So held every year, the World Heritage Committee is tasked to guide the state parties in directing efforts to improve the state of conservation of concerned properties. So committee's decisions rely on the, uh, the seriousness of the concerns uh, and the perspectives of the state parties' uh, engagement and the implementation of the recommendations. Sometimes decisions express no action uh, is required or recommend implementation of specific measures such as the implementation of the impact assessment, reactive monitoring mission, or uh, the additional report on specific uh, points. And in some of the more serious cases, the committee also can recommend the inscription of the property on the list in danger, or if uh, years of efforts uh, provide uh, in improvement, they can also recommend the removal from the list in danger. Um, and the, the worst case is a deletion from the World Heritage List, as you saw this year for the case of the river pool in England. Um, there, there is also the possibility of the deletion of the property from the World Heritage List. So we are approaching uh, the end of uh, my presentation. So uh, here I, I want to, uh, to talk about uh, this danger listing because um, um, many of the state parties um, dislike this idea. And of course uh, they are right. Uh, this is humiliating. This is, uh, this is not good for, for, for the image. So although the danger listing may be considered the most undesirable consequence, uh, this process enables a state party to receive the assistance from the committee and increased attention from other state parties to improve the situation. If you look at uh, some examples, um, danger listing uh, could um, mobilize international community uh, to cooperate uh, technically and financially to redress the situation. And the most importantly, through the danger listing process, a set of conditions are defined as desired state of conservation for removal of the property from the list in danger in cooperation with the state party, World Heritage Center, and the advisory bodies. So this is rather a mechanism for um, supporting the state party having uh, issues of the serious uh, conservation uh, problems uh, in their property uh, to set objectives uh, as it shows uh, the examples of Colombia, uh, you know, the danger listing on, on, of this uh, property on, it was uh, actually requested by the state party of Colombia itself. 
um, because they um, they need to um, to appeal to the international community and the committee uh, for the help uh, to uh, to fulfill the uh, the conditions to remove it from uh, this uh, this uh, this situation. So the ginger listing occurred in 2009. And then these uh, desired uh, conditions uh, for removal were set in 2012 uh, with the three indicators for addressing existing threats and two indicators for avoiding potential threats. So our resources uh, to help you to, um, to have uh, some case studies and to refer to uh, uh, previous uh, similar cases. When you are faced uh, by, um, for, for instance, the issues of uh, dam construction, the major urban development. So you can see in our system, uh, this compendium of uh, decisions and uh, case studies, uh, what, what were other state parties initiatives to address the similar situations? So this is very rich uh, database uh, of previous decisions uh, uh, and, um, and the state parties' efforts um, to show uh, how uh, we can uh, cope with uh, uh, such situations. So if needed, please uh, also visit this, um, this website. So in concluding, as, and as a transition to, uh, to the, the following sessions, I wish to recall uh, that our advisory bodies here represented uh, by um, Ms. Mizuki Murai, uh, IUCN, and Ms. Yuzin Jo from ICROM uh, and ICOMOS, um, are very important partners to this monitoring and uh, impact assessment process and all other statutory processes for the World Heritage Convention. So ICOMOS, IUCN, and the ICROM are closely associated uh, with the work of the World Heritage Committee and the Secretariat by providing the expertise and analysis for the working documents of the committee, developing important guidelines and the tools for conservation and management, and providing capacity building to the state parties as through this uh, uh, workshop. So um, my recommendation is uh, that when you uh, design an impact assessment, um, the early involvement of uh, our advisory bodies is very important because uh, they are the ones with the secretariat which will uh, also study you know, the state of conservation report from the state party and the uh, impact assessment uh, submitted by the state parties. So I think uh, we reach the end of the, uh, this uh, introduction. So I thank you very much for listening to me uh, and any questions are welcome in the chat box because I think I deplete my, uh, my time of speaking, of, uh, of talk. Thank you very much. <laughs>